Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the prevention of child abuse and neglect with special guests, Christine James Brown, President and CEO of the Child Welfare League of America, and Caitlin Brewer, President and CEO of Darkness to Light. So I'd like to thank you both for sharing the work of your organizations today. Uh, with us. And it's it, it's so very important. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for inviting us. It's a pleasure. So uh, I'm going to go uh, to you, Christine, uh, but I'll set you up with just sort of an intro with, with the fact that roughly 3 million children in America are annually reported as neglected or abused. Three quarters are neglected. 16% are physically abused. 10% are sexually abused and 0.2% are sex trafficked. Estimates are that 1,800 of these children died in 2021, which is a marker for where we are today. Mm. Uh, so as a, as a country, we periodically name a month to draw attention to civil society issues. And so April has been called uh, National Child Abuse Prevention Month. And so Christine, I'd like to uh, go to you because the Child Welfare League of America was founded more than a century ago uh, when uh, Carl uh, Carstens uh, had a speech in Baltimore, which basically um, indicted the nation for having a disjointed approach to serving children. And if, if we look at the statistics, we still um, have this issue. And so many children go to bed hungry every night, 20% uh, live in poverty. Um, Christine, uh, how do you feel about the progress that has been made? Have we made progress in certain areas and not in others? Have we basically been treading water? Um, what is the Child Welfare League of America view on what has happened over the years and how the, the situation has morphed in the last century. So let me start, and thanks for doing that research about our history. Um, let me start by, by just saying a couple of words about who we are as context for my response. We basically were established, as you mentioned, by a group of public and private child and family serving organizations. There was not a child welfare system at the time we were established. And we really were established to articulate what good services for children look like hmm. and, and to create peer pressure on each other, those in the network for achieving those good services. And the vehicles that we use for that included advocacy, you know, there's got to be policies that support good practice. There's got to be um, training. And there's got to be support for organizations to share innovation. So we have that network of things that we do that only collectively make us a child welfare league. We're not just an advocacy organization. The advocacy has to be built on a foundation of research that we do and our connection to the member agencies across the country. Um, and at the time that we were established, as I said, we were just child serving organizations and families. Over time, with CWLA working hard to get a child care system started, a home health care system started, a homemaker service system started, unfortunately, we can see ourselves as part of the issue because all these systems went off on their own. And we focus on those children most vulnerable who were at risk of abuse and neglect. So here we now have a system, and that is what we focus on. But increasingly, we recognize that child welfare is the welfare of children that everybody has responsibility for, and that all it's systems contribute to. It's right? intersectionality, what you're saying. Intersectionality, uh, absolutely. Is that if, you we, know, if, if, if we... Um, if we address these issues as if they 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 sit in isolation from one another, mm -hmm. we can never actually exactly exactly. And we're actually releasing a paper at the end of the month that really is going to push that issue hard. But what we've learned is, first of all, you can't have this system called child welfare sitting in the middle 
of what happens in society without the intersectionality that's required. Um, mental health services, um, the understanding of housing. You know, if you look at all the things that drive people into the child welfare system, it's mental health issues, housing issues, lack of access to resources, poor education, living in communities that have violence and all of the kinds of things. But across all of that is a lack of this country, unlike many others, to establish a strong safety net for families. We don't have a family policy and we don't have things that other countries have, a robust child care system, a robust um, child allowance system. We don't have those things in a very coordinated, organized way so everybody can benefit from them. We don't so that's where we that's our, where our problem starts, right? In our country. We don't we don't treat our children as if they are the most precious exactly. Um uh element of society that that they are the future adults they are the future exactly of 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 our country there's not you know how there's a policy for aging Mm -hmm. there's not one for families there's not one for children why is that and then we wonder why we have abuse and neglect you know you mentioned in the beginning most of the calls that we receive are about neglect what are the issues that drive neglect it's it there are issues related to poverty and the trauma and stress that poverty places on families. It's not the families that are abusing. You can't blame it on poverty, but poverty creates all of those factors that put families into crisis. So it's when you ask about progress, I think the progress is now understanding issues of trauma more and their impact on families understanding the issue of lack of resources and their impact on families, frankly, understanding the issues of racism, systemic mm-hmm. racism and their impact on families. All of these things we, in, 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 a, in a way that's not about blaming, it's about acknowledging that these are things that impact families. Well, it's about dealing with, right? Right, in, right. In terms of darkness to light, you actually are working on a part of this of mm-hmm. this issue. Could you talk a little bit about what you do and why you do it and why the work that you do is so unique within the sector and so useful? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Darkness to Light is an international social enterprise nonprofit that focuses on ed- educating adults to prevent child sexual abuse specifically. Um, so everything that Chris was just talking about, um, it you know, we work tangentially because sexual abuse often happens in homes where there are neglect and physical abuse and domestic violence and all of that. But you just unpack that that little tidbit um, uh, right in real time. Could you talk a little bit about the percentage of sexual abuse and, and, and where it actually transpires? Yeah, absolutely. So the the stat that we use is that one in 10 children will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. Um, that is directly correlated with teenage pregnancy. 50% of teenage pregnancies are carried by children who were sexually abused. Um, and 50%, part of that 50%, 50% of teenage pregnancies are oh. carried. It, it's not it 50% is not a result of the child sexual abuse. It is that the person who is carrying the pregnancy uh, was a victim of child sexual abuse. Right. Um, and so you find yourself, you know, but child sexual abuse is like the ugly stepsister of all of the abuses, right? Um, it, it's weird. Americans in particular, we're, we don't shy away from talking about violence, but we definitely shy away from talking about sex, particularly sex with children. Um, and I understand it's a horrible topic to talk about. And no one wants to think that anyone is capable of doing that. But the reality is it's an epidemic in our society. And I would argue that that one in 10 statistic is actually quite conservative. We have early estimates um, with some research that is being done out of Oregon that it could be as high as one in three children. And this is also because of the onset of um, child sexual abuse materials online and access and kids having access to pornography and, you know, all kinds of things that are happening with the introduction of technology. But sort of back to darkness to light, we were formed 23 years ago by a group of survivors um, who said, you know, 
in in America, we're training kids on how to prevent, help them protect themselves from child sexual abuse. And if you understand abuse, you understand that it's a power dynamic and that the, the, the person being abused is never going to be equally as powerful as the person who's doing the abuse. And so we have to educate adults on how they can be active bystanders and upstanders to minimize opportunity for that abuse to ever occur. Right. And so we built this training, Stewards of Children. It's our flagship training. Um, and I joined about six and a half years ago and sort of expanded some of the things that we do. But that's basically who Darkness Delight is. So you're basically talking about that, which which people try not to talk about because of their own <laughs> awkwardness, because um, of, you know, where does it lead? Right. They don't mm-hmm. know what to do with that with, with that emotion. So it bottles up. Um, and what you're doing is you're basically releasing it. You're bringing it out into the open. Your founders were abused themselves. That required them to basically talk with each other and with the world about their own. So you're taking this thing of shame and you're saying, no, the shame isn't ours. Mm-hmm. The shame might be elsewhere, but it's not ours. Mm-hmm. And we're going to transform that into action. That's a, such an admirable act. And a courageous act of uh, of of uh, you to uh, undertake, in terms of in terms of dealing with with some of these uh, attitudes, because if you go back to um, Chris, uh, Chris's organization, uh, the Child Welfare League of America, if you take a look at those early speeches, those speeches were rife with racism, with um, attitudes toward the disabled. Mm -hmm. or people who had uh, mental health challenges or learning disabilities that were just so negative. And and things are changing in the same way, sexual abuse hidden under the covers and now being brought brought to light. How are you both functioning? And we'll start with with, uh, Caitlin, uh, and then we'll go over to you, Chris. How are you functioning to transform attitudes within society so that a society itself is equipped better equipped to deal with these issues. Caitlin? Yeah, so I'm going to nerd out for just a second and talk about (laughs) our social behavior change strategy. Um, So I admittedly have not worked in child welfare my whole career. I spent 10 years living and working in Africa, helping um, organizations there build health system strengthening, agriculture, women's empowerment, malaria reduction, you name it, we did it. and what I was, what I learned there is that training is only really one part of a social behavior change structure. And so you need a variety of different things when you're looking at systemically moving an issue. And I'll take something as simple as seatbelts, right? Um, for the Gen Zers out there watching, you might not remember that there weren't always seatbelts in cars. Um, and back in the 70s, even before my time, um, my parents used to talk about laying in the back of station wagons, you know, on top of each other. And it was just yep. bedlam in the car, right? Yep. Well, now you can't even pull out of the driveway without your seatbelt, you know, dinging at you and mom looking at you in the rearview mirror, yelling at you, saying, I'm not going to move this car if you don't have your seatbelt on. And you have your click it or ticket campaigns with the police and you have, you know, uh, school systems that are putting seatbelts on buses and all sorts of things. And that all came because we hit each level of the socio-ecological model and allowed for self-efficacy and risk perception to be built within those different levels of the socio-ecological model where we so are decided. You taking, are you taking the same approach to, to sexual abuse where you are trying to hit the different levels and you're not just being a person standing up in front of people and educating them? How, are, how do you translate that? So what we are trying to uh, establish are standard operating behaviors. And I'll give you an example. Kids go on a field trip and they come back on the bus and parents are picking up and teachers are there and it start, the people start to dwindle, right? And it's the last two kids. Instead of that second to last parent coming and picking their kid up and leaving, that parent stands there and talks with the teacher until the final parent gets there to pick up the student because they're following the rule of three and they're never leaving a child alone with a teacher or an administrator. And what that does is it minimizes opportunity. It keeps the child safe. It keeps the teacher safe and everybody goes home and is happy. 
And there are a, a multitude of ways that we as a society can act differently in small ways, you know, around uh, in every facet of our life to be able to minimize that opportunity to keep children safe. So, Chris, um, as as you're trying to transform and you've been doing it for 100 years and you, you, you're expert at it, the organization, <laughs> how, do, how, do, how have you dealt with issues like embedded racism um, in uh, um, uh, attitudes about the disabled, uh, other other impediments to uh, staying on top of this issue and serving everyone in the United States. No, I, I think that all of what Caitlin said, I could not agree more. Um, I think the one thing I would have added was is the importance of changing language, mm-hmm. you know, and not mm-hmm. talking about. Um, vulnerable children, but talking about children who are vulnerable, not talking about poor children, not calling them foster children, you know, those foster kids, those things just click reminders in our heads. Could you, you, could you repeat that point? So so you're saying that that as you characterize people, you diminish them. Yes. So that if you if you change your language to create more of a of a community. Where- and an understanding of, of the, the impact that labeling has. Mm-hmm. on the people being labeled. So people I was saying that language. only to agree with Kate, that some of it is really mm-hmm. simple. It's behavior, mm-hmm. it's language, it's those mm-hmm. kinds of things. Um, but it's also um, doing things when, when it gets to the impact of race and um, child welfare. We're now seeing agencies, first of all, it's awareness. You know, people are in denial a lot, saying, well, we're not racist. So you have to separate individual racism and talk about structural racism. Mm -hmm. What are the ways that child welfare was designed and what's the world that it's living in, the larger structure that will drive it, you know? And there are things within all of our systems that drive racist actions, right? There are assumptions, right? There are assumptions. It's not the assumptions. It's it's how we think about um, single parent families. It's how we think about people who are poor, but it's also how certain systems are structured, right? So we are now going through a process across the field of understanding what are the structures within our system that don't allow us to be what we know we need to be for families. And, and the biggest challenge for child welfare is we are, of all of the other systems delivering human services, ours is is driven by legal actions, legal policies, legal requirements. So a lot of the clinical behaviors that we want to to utilize are are influenced by the legal, like the the law says you have to do this. The law says you have to do that. Courts are part of the child welfare system. So everybody else is saying, no, you can't. I'll give you one quick example. Talking to a group of our workers about why can't we be kinder when we have to go into a home and remove a child? Well, there are all kinds. Of, so one of the workers said, well, you know, whenever I go into a home, I call grandma or I call someone who can lower the temperature in the home. And the rest of the workers said, are you allowed to do that? There's so many things that take our humanity away. They don't allow us to to function as humans. And then what Caitlin was saying about the stigma around sexual abuse, we know it. So when uh, when we look at risk factors for moving, removing a child, is the uncle living in the house? Right. I mean, all these things we look at. So we know it, but we don't say it out loud enough. And I think, Caitlin, the only challenge I've had in my head thinking about the change in behavior with seatbelts is that people don't see themselves as potentially being a victim of sexual abuse or any kind of abuse. They don't see it, but they can see it, you know, in a car. Right. Right. So somehow, and one of the ways in child welfare that we're kind of helping people understand families that are fragile is kinship. Mm-hmm. Um, almost everyone for for a week or sometime has had to go to a relative to be cared for because mom was in the hospital or dad was out of work. I know for myself it happened frequently throughout my life, right? Mm-hmm. By our saying that kinship has to be a better option in, in child welfare, more and more people are understanding, okay, I thought it was those people that were having mm-hmm. trouble. 
mm-hmm. you know, and that we're responding to the tensions in their lives. But it, it's all of us. And if we don't happen to have a neighbor nearby or a relative nearby, we could end up. Right. So I think that foundational thing in child in, in um, with seatbelts that we have to work on harder in child welfare is how universal is the issue mm. and how many people are going to be helped by that by wearing seatbelts. I want to talk a little bit about uh, this this theme of changing attitudes on the one hand and bringing things out into the open on the other. You know, if we if we look at the the debate that is going on uh, today, there is a desire to not deal with certain things, which mm-hmm. you find in every community, right? Um, Caitlin uh, called it out in terms of, of sexual abuse. But it's also in different communities not dealing with our history on race and not even teaching it, making that illegal, not actually looking at poverty. Right. Um, you know, whenever I'm, I, I was in um, I was in a, a neighborhood the other day, whenever I'm in a neighborhood and I see uh, and I walk a lot and I see a homeless encampment, I walk through the homeless encampment because I want to understand what is going on in the neighborhoods that I'm serving. Right. And and that's that's a choice because of the sensitivity that that people like yourselves bring to me. You have to kind of get involved and be and open your eyes rather than stay in your safe space. Right. Right. How do we encourage people to, first of all, have compassion for others? For example, your founder, Chris, well-intentioned as that group was, they had attitudes that today would be condemned across a very broad swath. So how do we give each other a break so that we can each make a, a positive contribution, but also allow the other to be educated? Like people have been have given me a break and allowed me to become more educated. And I still have a lot of education to go through. How do we mm-hmm. how do we deal with that in a society where we can get everybody <laughs> engaged in a positive way as opposed to a condemning way, Chris? So, you know, I think we have some type of challenge going on in this country right now that we can't talk about the things that impact our families and children. We can't talk about guns. We can't talk about race. We can't talk about any of those things because it's like we can't talk about anything. So we can't solve the problem. So we can't solve our, 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 our hands. Right. But the reality is we are ultimately a learning society. So when I first started to work at the United way, way back in, I'm not going to tell you when in the eighties, One of my first projects was to look at the needs of women and girls. And I identified, among other things, domestic violence as one of the issues we had to deal with. I was almost fired. Really? Domestic violence at that time was under the rug. People didn't talk about it. People were in denial about it. It was it just didn't exist. Right. Fast forward to now, people understand it as an issue and its impact on families generationally, right? So I think, I don't want to say we got to wait because there was a lot of work being done by domestic violence groups to make that change happen, groups like Caitlin's. But some of it is just going to happen as we get smarter about all these things that moving forward. Um, I think that we've been, as, as the Child Welfare League of America, just like our founder was not in the right place. We've been at times in the wrong place around um, Native American issues, mm. right? We've made apologies about that. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we put the balance on concern about poverty rather than the understanding of the importance of relationships with your family and community. Mm-hmm. So it's always, it's usually not, it's just a balancing thing. How do you find the right balance, right? I think we have to just, and I've been called out in the last month about that. You know, how can you talk about this when you did that? And um, my answer is unintended consequences. We have to get smarter understanding the unintended consequences of any things we do, particularly when they relate to children and families, because those are life changing decisions that get made. I'd like to ask Caitlin um, about men, because abuse is primarily perpetrated by men, people of my gender. Mm -hmm. Right. 
men are, are so responsible for this. Do we have to help men change their attitudes? And I mean, across the board, I mean, my attitude personally, my attitude today, my attitude needs to continue to evolve. I'm talking about all of us because it, it doesn't escape my notice that most of the time when we're talking about these issues, I'm interviewing women. There are very, very few men who make a career out of these particular areas in comparison to the number of women. Mm -hmm. Part of the change that needs to take place, Caitlin? Oh, we could have a whole nother session <laughs> just on this topic. Um, the answer is yes and. Um, yes, we do need to have men have a universal shift in mindset, but it's not just on men. Um, it's a community at large. And I think we need to think about um, refraining from othering. You know, a lot of what Chris has talked about this whole time is that people assume that this happens in other families or other communities or other countries or, you know, it's it doesn't happen here in my world. It, the men I know are good people, um, but those other men are are bad people we have to accept that we are all part of this together. We're in this together. We are all citizens of this country, of this community, of this world. And without accepting some of that responsibility, whether it's the toxic masculinity culture or um, structural, you know, influencing the community based uh, development with structural racism or w whatever we're talking about, we are part of it. I might not have written the law or the rule, but I benefit from X, Y, and Z. And so with toxic masculinity, you know, there are women out there who really support this idea of a really strong alpha man who's toxic. And they're not, you know, they're not ready for that change because that's what they might be attracted to. And so we have to have a conversation about how, where that demand is coming from for that masculine behavior, in addition to the patriarchy and how you know, structurally, men have been able to rise and receive positions of power. So there isn't there isn't necessarily a person to blame or a group to blame. It's really about us all. If we're going to be the change, if, it's if shared responsibility. Change. It's not right. blame. It's really shared responsibility. I think, Caitlin, that's what she's saying. I mean, and, and we have to look at have we engaged and involved men? You know, I know in our organization, we started several years ago to to engage and involve more men. And um, if you listen to what they've said, they've said, well, you know, even when I was a child welfare worker, I was engaged more to move the boxes and to help the, the boys who were a little bit, you know, out of hand, rather than just for my understanding and knowledge to families. So it, it it's also engaging and involving and listening to men and listening to the, the community about it want, what it wants for children and families. You know, We're not going to change toxic masculinity without the involvement of men. It's not going to happen. Um, and and I think we ourselves have, you know, uh, I know a lot of people that would be suspect of a male social worker. Why, are, why do you want access to children, you know, because of the race? And so it's sort of this double-edged sword. And again, I'm not saying that the stats aren't reality. They are. 97% of sexual assault is committed or abuse is committed by men. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it isn't all of our problem to solve. You know, one of my great heroes, uh, Cecil Williams, was talking about in one of our interviews, um, the idea of mutuality. And he was talking about his relationship with his wife, Jan Marikatani. But I think what they both were talking about was something bigger mutuality meaning mutual respect giving each other space listening to each other even if you don't necessarily agree understanding the other person's point of view mm -hmm. um, and, and never stopping this sort of compassionate engagement this very um, energized compassionate engagement and that's really what you're what you're both talking about is is coming to grips with your history coming to grips with yourself and your need to change uh, you're really talking about mutuality in a, in a, in a really uh, grand way. You know, one of the examples of this where it's been successful um, that I've seen is in South Africa and Zimbabwe during the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, even though men were responsible for transmission of HIV AIDS and you could have ostracized them, the reality is all the programs that 
included men as caregivers um, for families that were losing family members at a rapid pace during the height of the AIDS epidemic were the most successful projects in repairing family bonds, reducing domestic violence, um, and, you know, allowing that people to heal in what was, you know, a, a truly scary time in these countries. And so that's what I'm saying. I, I just think we need to think holistically about what the solutions are um, and include all people. And I think what what um, we we've not talked enough about, at least in child welfare, there was a lot more progress, I think, in mental health is engaging, involving the people we're working with. You mm-hmm. know, if anyone should be looked at as an expert in mm-hmm. what they need, it's the people that we work with, the families, the youth. And there's a huge effort now in child welfare to better and appropriately and um, honestly engage, recognizing the power differential and how that plays out and not talking about, well, we're share power, but we want to bring your power into the equation. It's not a sharing power thing. Um, it's really bringing their power into the equation. And I, I think it goes back to it. It's a, it's the entire community and everyone involved in the responsibility of making sure our children and families are safe and um, reach their full potential that we have to focus on. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think, I don't think there's any other way to do it, but I would like to ask Caitlin, if you don't mind, can I answer a question? Um <laughs> We are the only country, Caitlin, you may or may not know, that has not adopted the UN Convention for the Rights of the Child. Yep. Only country. Even Mm -hmm. some of the ones who I know have adopted it and they're really not where they are. And I've always, and I've been working on that issue for a long time. And I talked about it a lot in when I was working on the international side. Mm -hmm. And I find it, I was I was wondering how the people you work with outside of the U.S. are different from the ones inside of the U.S. with respect to the work that you're doing. That's such, seems a, to be great such a different mindset it is. about child rights. It's entirely different. And um, the Oak Foundation is a foundation out of Switzerland that funds child sexual abuse prevention. In fact, they're one of the only foundations in the world that focuses on this. And they brought a group of international folks together that do similar work to Darkness to Light in London. And the feedback all of the American organizations got at that session was that we do not put the child first enough. It's always adults talking about what the child needs versus children telling adults what they need. And it was a stark reminder of the world that I had come from, um, whereby we always thought about children first, you know, in the work that I did across the continent of Africa. And um, I think it's it, it's an American mindset not yeah. to pay attention to the needs of the children. Um, and their children. Yes. Yeah. People pay yeah. attention to their children. Yeah. Maybe their neighbors, but. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not too much for. And that's not a good thing. That's why I think we got more to figure out how do we break that? Well, the legal system does not take child testimony as actual evidence. So when you're talking about child sexual abuse um, being, you know, brought through the the justice system, you can't even take a child's testimony, you know, as as proper evidence for their own victimization. It's insane. So, you know, thinking through how our legal system treats children in and of itself is a a huge priority of the, the federal advocacy that we need to do. Well, I think that, that what you both pointed to, and it's a great wrap-up thought, is that all we need to do is place children at the center of, of our social compact mm-hmm. so that every child is our child. Mm-hmm. Every child needs to be treated, as you say, Chris. You know, we, we, we make a separation between our children and other people's children. And our other people's children is just not, are just not our business. But we have to shift that in society. And if we do that, everything else follows, right? The yeah. intersectionality follows, the legal system follows, the care follows. Christine James Brown, President CEO of the Child Welfare League of America, and Caitlin Brewer, President CEO of Darkness to Light, please thank your staffs, your, your board members, your funders, your community, your clients as well. Your clients are, as you said, Chris, they are part of the solution. We ought to listen, yeah. listen listen to the expertise that people who have gone through um, these experiences have and adjust the systems to meet their needs. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us.